This is very revealing. Just wow. I ain't taking no slice from nobody. It's God. It's the only person that I serve. My mom ain't here. My mama was sacrificed. Me too. You understand? Yeah. We appreciate you. Michael Jordan. What about him? His dad, right? Mm -hmm. Bill Cosby, his son, right? Dr. Dre, his son. You know, out in Hollywood, a lot of people come up missing. Feels like it might be a lot of that in order to control, traumatize. They want to monetize and traumatize. And if you think you've seen it all, then I've got a big surprise for you. This is ASAP Rocky, a very successful rapper. But there's a dark side to his fame, and I'm gonna let him tell us what the dark side is. Oh, every time I'm about to release an album, for some strange reason, man, I always lose somebody close to me. My pops, it was James, my sister, like, I always lose somebody close to me, you know, I feel like, you know, some crazy, like, Jinxes. If y'all notice, every time I put out a, a album, it's like I lose somebody. Like I lost my pops. With my first album, I lost hands with my second album. This is the baby, another famous rapper. He said this about his own dad. And you really lost him the same day you hit number one. God, with the same time, not the nah, nah. It was baby on baby. It went like number one. It was like number seven or something like that. And then uh, I had got the phone call. I'm halfway asleep. And yeah, bro, dad, bro, he dead, he died. I'm like, what? I set up on my bed. I'm like, what? Same time, Carter, he blowing my phone up while I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I'm thinking he calling to deliver the same news. I click over, what's up, bro? We number one. We number one. You did it. You yeah, did it. I'm like, damn. He said, it's, I just. One more person on our list is this female rapper who goes by Megan the Stallion. She heavily promotes ungodliness in her music videos. And I want you to listen to the events that unfolded in her life when the fame came. Meg made sacrifices to get where she is. Right as Meg started to take off, her mother passed away. Once her mother passed away, Meg became a superstar and would eventually sign with Jay-Z's Rock Nation management. Very similar to Kanye West, who after starting to finally see success in the music industry lost his mother while also working under Jay-Z. The patterns that you've got from watching these clips that I just shared was this. Somebody becomes famous and all of a sudden, they lose their close relatives. For the case of Kanye West, this is no coincidence because he literally admitted it on camera. Could it be that the same happened to the other individuals that I just mentioned? Well, let's try piecing the puzzles together here, shall we? There's this other individual who goes by Christian Shaney, and I featured her in one of my last videos. And in that video, she talked about how she was enticed to literally sell her soul for fame. I shared part of her confession last time, but this time, I want you to listen to the full confession of what really happened. Um, and was working on singles, had songs on the radio. Uh, I opened up for Nicki Minaj. I opened up for... Um, who was it? Not Pitbull. Oh my gosh, it's so, so long ago. I don't want to throw names. You could just Google my previous name, CC Segura. Oh, just seeing it gives me the cringe because that whole name itself is a whole story. But so the very first time when I was working with this producer, we were working on my first album to get me shopped to get a, a major deal. And we were taking a break from recording this album and he took me around the studio and this is someone who's been in the industry like he's worked with big names and so he was like hey so you know that if you were to sell your soul to the devil you can have instant fame tomorrow yes a music wow. producer i was working with he actually said those words he actually said those words i had I don't even want to say a dream anymore. It was definitely a vision or an out of out of body experience because I felt more alive and more alert than I do right now talking to you. Mm. Like, I, I I felt my my soul felt everything. It's like my fingertips could breathe. Like it was I was so alert, mm. and it I it looked like I was in space. And then this being approaches me, and he's all silhouette because there's you know he's not illuminated. He's just dark. Mm. And as he's approaching me, he's huge. And he's approaching me and as he's approaching me, uh, I said to him in my ignorance, Lord, 
because I, I knew I I didn't know if he was God. I didn't know if he was an angel. I didn't I knew he was someone powerful. I didn't know who he was. And he said to me, no, you know who this is. And the moment he said that, I knew it was Satan because I was not living right. I knew I was constantly turning my back against God because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I knew this. I was full blown, well aware of my sin. It was so real to you. This more, is more real than me waking up every day and being a mom and being a loving. It's more real. It was more real. And he was like, if you worship me, I will give you all of these things. I will give you, I forgot the name of a, of a man. He named some guy because I really wanted to be married. I really wanted a healthy relationship. He named a guy. He said, I'll give you fame. I'll give you success. I'll make you the world's bi bi biggest star. And when he's saying these things, the earth became like one of those future balls that like witches use or like psychics use to show your fortune. It was doing that. It was showing me things as he was saying them. And I was looking at it and I'm like, no, I'm, I'm the daughter of Christ. No. And it's like in that moment, the moment he started saying, if you worship me, I'm like, oh, I'm in a, I have a choice to make. And I chose the Lord in that moment, mm. like for real. And he said, after I said, no, I'm the daughter of Christ. He called mm. me the B word. Never forget it. Wow. Word. And I flung a little for lack of a better word, I flung back and I woke up with a gasp, like, I just snorted right now. <laughs> but, and my heart was racing so fast. Even waking up, that felt less alive than I did in that moment. Remember this other rapper that we talked about earlier? He filmed himself doing some sort of ritual, which was demonic. The music video for ASAP's song, What's Up, off his debut album features a shot of ASAP standing in the middle of a pentagram and seemingly performing some kind of ritual. And to understand how all this ties to people offering sacrifices to the enemy, you first have to understand the laws that govern both the spiritual realm, that is the world that we cannot see, and this natural realm. And to see the bigger picture of this laws, we have to look at this thing called covenants. You've certainly heard about covenants in the Bible. Well, a covenant in simple terms is it's a contractual relationship between two parties where there are promises, conditions of the relationship and consequences if those conditions were unmet. And one popular example is Adam and Eve, because when God formed man, he gave him dominion and authority over the entire earth. But man broke this covenant he had with God through disobedience and therefore lost the dominion he had. And that dominion was handed over to the enemy. Listen to this verse here, okay? This is Luke chapter 4, verse 5 to 7. And this is when Jesus was tempted. It is written, The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Now I want you to note that part where it is written, it has been given to me. So authority and dominion was transferred from man, from Adam, to the enemy, and the enemy now rules over the fallen world. He's the God of this fallen world. This is a clear and significant distinction. Jesus in John 12, 31 called Satan the prince of this world. Satan involves the whole human race of unregenerate people in his evil system. Listen to Ephesians 2, 2. Before you were saved, you were operating, verse 2, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. You were living in the lusts of your flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So yes, the evil one and his demonic spirits, they know very well about covenants, and they know how to take advantage of the ignorant and unbelieving world 
who know nothing about the existence of the spiritual realm into their slavery. Let's zone in here on this verse that I just quoted to you and let's see the hidden details of how people can enter into satanic covenants with the evil one and in return can get materialistic stuff. In Luke chapter 4 verse 7 it is written, and this is the enemy speaking, if you worship me, it will be yours. Now note that if you worship me, if you worship me, it will it will all be yours. So one way of entering such a covenant is through open worship of the enemy. Well, what kind of worship is this? Well, this kind of worship is a deeper level of worship. It's not a surface level kind of worship where unbelievers partake in because they belong to the world. There's a deeper level of demonic worship where an individual chooses to willingly give themselves over to the enemy in allegiance. It's similar in a way when you worship God, okay? Worshiping God is not singing a slow song as many would think, but it's simply a life of complete devotion and faithfulness to God. With the enemy, this involves being initiated in a ritualistic way, just like the following examples. Man, just listen to this. About my satanic cellmate, many of you heard me talk about a gentleman that I lived with while I was incarcerated. This guy used to work in those shops where, you know, the crystal balls and the tarot cards, because he was reared in this. This was his practice. This was his profession. Witchcraft is what he indulged in. And he said his old coven met with him and told him that they needed him. He said, man, we need you. We trying to get some done. And he was like a high priest in this stuff. He was a high practicing witch, a warlock, a warlock because he was a male. He said, man, he went back to the house with these guys. And he said, as he was going back to the house, he said, when he got out the car, get ready to the end of the house, he said he heard a voice saying, don't go in there, don't go in there. And he said all these scriptures that the old man had been telling him was just bum rushing his mind. That's in rapid order. That's how God is. When God warning you a lot of times, he'll bring to your remembrance things that he has said to you. He said he heard a literal voice saying, don't go in there, don't go in there. But he was rebellious in heart, never fully surrendered. He went in the house anyway. Before he got in the house, he said, one of the guys looked at him and said, you know, so-and-so here, it was a female that he always wanted to be intimate with. This debate. He said when he got in the house, she was at the top of the stairs, you know, looking seductive and everything. He bit the bait, went upstairs, did what he'd been wanting to do, had his way or whatnot. All this was to soften him up. He said, after they did that and come back downstairs, he said, you, you, they see, he told me everybody said, are you ready? And he practiced this seance with them because he was deeply steeped in this stuff at one point. Well, still, but he was, you know, fighting with it, I guess. He said, after they did the seance, got in the circle around the pentagram in the living room, etc. He said, as soon as they finished, he said, the girl was standing next to him. He said, she looked at him and said, you can't go back now. You can't go back now. And once one has been initiated, as you have heard, there's no going back. You cannot go back by your own strength unless Jesus himself breaks that covenant by the power of his blood. Now, there are certainly many levels of these types of covenants according to the selfish needs of the one that will seek out after such covenants. So I hope you understand now, when I say that somebody has sold their soul, one of the things that I mean is that they have entered a covenantal relationship with the enemy in return of, you know, money, fame, this temporary worldly stuff. And I know, yes, all souls belong to God. That is indeed true. God has dominion over each soul at the end of the day. He alone is the judge of all souls. And he alone can save one soul from the enemy by the power of the blood of Jesus under the new covenant. Because the good thing is that there is a much more beautiful covenant, a more glorious covenant in my estimation than anything in this world. And that is the messianic covenant created by God in the blood of Jesus. And man, thank God for this new covenant because it redeems those that are under the power of the enemy. Because, you know, I've heard people say that everybody is a child of God. But that's just not the truth. 
that's just not true. If you have a basic understanding of what covenants are, then you'll understand that those who are in the world, they're not children of God, but children of the devil. And that is just the harsh truth. But when you come under this new covenant, then you will be adopted as a child of God. You know, one amazing thing that I discovered while reading through the New Testament is how God revealed these two camps that are in constant spiritual battle. That is the kingdom of God where Jesus is king and the kingdom of the world run by Satan. The world is that sphere or that group of people who has no affection for the things of God. The world exists in this regard in antithesis and opposition and tension over against the kingdom of God. And so he says, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world, so sanctify them through your truth Thy word is truth. That is a loaded statement, isn't it? And this blew my mind because it showcases that at the end of the day, every human being is a citizen of either of these two camps. There is no in between. Now I want you to let that really sink in, okay? At the end of the day, one is either a child of God or a child of the devil. One is either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. One is either in the kingdom of darkness or in the kingdom of light. It's either you're mastered by Jesus Christ or you're mastered by the God of this fallen world. It's either you're in the new covenant and you belong to Jesus or you're under the dominion of the God of this fallen world. Now, if you're a Christian, you're called a war. If you're not a Christian, you're a prisoner of war. Jesus said this. He said, you gather with me or you scatter against me. If you're not for Jesus, you're against him. And if you're against him, you're serving the devil. I've had so many people say, well, hey, wait a minute. I don't even believe the devil's real. My answer, good. You'll serve him better. That's what he wants. That's why if something opposes the word of God, no matter how subtle, or less of a big deal it may appear to be because the world tends to romanticize and dump down the seriousness of sin. Hear me out. If something opposes the word of God, then it's not from God. And that means it is from the world. And once you realize that no sin comes from God, but from the world that is governed by the enemy, then surely your perspective will change because it is written in 1 John 2.16, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. When I'm being tempted to do something, I need to realize, first of all, this is not from God, and this is not according to God's will, and this is not conformed to God's character. I need to see sin for what it really is, something that stands in opposition to everything that God is and everything that He desires. This is not just some little mistake. This is hostility. It's enmity. It's fighting against God and God's purposes in my life. And so I need to recognize sin for what it is. It's not coming from God. And this reality of a dual world where there are only two sides of the coin has made me realize that every time that you choose sin over God, then that means that you're choosing to drink from the sewer of the enemy's filth. Yes, it's a hard pill to swallow, but it is the truth. Because truth be told, as I've just said, there are only two camps here, those that are the sheep and those that are the goats, the wheat and the tares, heaven 
or hell, good or evil, the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness, the slaves of sin or the slaves of righteousness. And there is no sitting on the sidelines here. You don't get to step aside and say that I'm not going to play this game. I'm not going to participate in this party. No, that's why you must pick and choose who your master will be, my friend. Is it going to be the Lord Jesus Christ or the enemy? And one great truth that I myself have experienced as I follow Jesus is that the more you love God, the more you love Jesus, the more your sinful desires lose their grip on you. It is a great mystery to me, to be honest. The more that I've grown in my love for Jesus, the more I have deemed sin unworthy of submitting to, and the easier it has been for me to obey God. And the beautiful thing is that it comes so naturally. So focus in growing in your love for Jesus. And this does prove that the Bible is true because here it is written, John 14, 23, and this is Jesus speaking. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. You know, many would say that why would God tell us not to sin? Why is he be like a restrainer to us enjoying life? Because spiritually blind people will accuse God of being a killjoy or something. But the day that you realize that sin comes from the devil and it's not from God, then and only then will you have a greater understanding of this thing. Love of God is the starting point and is the source of every virtue. Love of the world is the source of every evil. Love of God is the starting point and source of every virtue. And of course, as St. James, the brother of our Lord, writes in the New Testament, if we are friends of the world, we make ourselves enemies of God. We cannot be friends of God if we become friends of the world. Because love of God and love of world are opposing forces in the heart. They oppose each other actively. So thank you for watching this video. And if you'd like to support this channel, there are links in the description for that. Just to let you know, channel memberships are up. You can become a member if you'd like to support this channel in that manner. God bless you. I'll see you in the next one if the Lord wills it.